Hi everyone, welcome to Dear Banff, the show for PR and marketing pros like you. Hosted by Beck Bamberger of BAM. BAM is a communications agency that believes stories move the world. We move stories forward for technology-driven brands that challenge, change, and create entire industries. Today, on the Dear Banff podcast, we're talking with Elise Brown, Director of Marketing at Anthemis Group, a leading global early-stage venture capital firm. Elise has more than 10 years of experience as a strategic marketer in the fintech industry. She continues to rise through the industry as a sought-after marketer, helping fintech companies strive to understand their clients on a deeper level by bringing a human element that oftentimes is missing and increase their overall market share. Most recently, Elise was recognized for her leadership in the industry by New York fintech women and listed as an inspiring fintech female in 2020. Let's dive in. Welcome everyone to Dear Banff. I'm Beck Bamberger and this is the podcast to get all of your marketing and PR questions answered and to learn about some incredible great people in the comms marketing realm, such as our wonderful guest today, Elise Brown from Anthemis, and she's going to talk about that. Welcome, Miss Elise. Thank you so much, Beck, for having me. I'm so looking forward to the conversation. Yes, and we've got some good questions here today, so we'll be solving a bunch of stuff here. First off, for those who don't know, would you give us a nice rundown on Anthemis and what you guys are up to there? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Beck. So Anthemis is the world's leading global fintech and insurtech VC firm committed to cultivating change in financial services. So we've been around since 2010, and we are based in New York, Europe, and then I look forward to seeing what's next for us into this next decade. It's very likely that if you were doing anything that has that touches fintech, apps, digital payments, anything, it's probably in Anthemis's portfolio. I could tell. I could tell that. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, I've always loved this. Just so if people want to look, I love beautiful video roll on websites. You guys have this lovely like floral one, which is, I think, very distinct for fintech. So get to their website. By the way, it's Anthemis. It's A-N-T-H-E-M-I-S dot com if you want to check it out and all their wonderful portfolio companies. Cool. Well, it's been crazy times, at least as we know, especially in the last 12 months. What are you most proud of? in terms of accomplishing? Yeah, so it has been a crazy year. I mean, honestly, I would say pivoting Anthemis's marketing strategy. I know that similar to many others, we had a thought out plan in the beginning of 2020, but it needed to change once the pandemic happened in March. And I would say one of the notable accomplishments in the overall strategy was events. So again, many of us have well-oiled machines when it comes to in-person events, but we also had to pivot for our event strategy as a whole and go more towards the webinar route. And we had to do this not only to support our investor relations team, but also support our investor team to ensure we're consistently staying connected to startups in the ecosystem as well. Especially because everyone's now in this realm. And I know those listening are dealing with this as well. What did you learn out of doing that significant pivot? Just curious. Was it well received? Did you see burnout? Like how'd it go? And I mean, we're still doing it too, of course. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Huh? We're definitely still yeah. doing it. So the one thing I would say is that I did see a bit of burnout towards the end of the year, just mm, noting mm-hmm. how many we actually produced. Makes sense. But the good thing about webinars, which we really did not... I would say we didn't see the impact until towards the end is the fact that you can repurpose webinars for a lot of different uses. Oh yeah. It's content gold. Correct. You can convert them into podcasts. You can create really great content, driving people back to the replays to capture that information. But I would say you have to stay creative in all your webinars, making sure you just don't have internal folks on those webinars, but you have thought leaders in the ecosystem and space to you know, merge into that authentic collaboration, ensuring that you're really providing thoughtful insights and it's just not coming from your firm. And then speaking of, maybe it's through webinars, I don't know, but do you have a favorite way that you tell stories right now or that you explore stories? Yeah, so I would say 
The best way I really feel like has worked for us is visual storytelling through videos. Yes. So it can be accomplished through several different goals. So giving a unique, compelling account of events. And I think that once you have the subject matter expertise behind that and actually putting an individual's face with the brand, it's really helpful. We saw that when we released the top five tips for female founders under five minutes. It's on YouTube. Everyone check it out. And we saw a really great lift from that too as well. But actually having our investors that are the faces of the female founders lab and helping them share insights on how do you pitch for pre-seed companies at Anthem is, you know, how do you build your brand on a budget in five minutes? It's easily able to like convey the story we want to tell, but it's in a cultivating type of way, in a captivating type of way. Nice. And you've been able to produce these even despite this time. Correct. And it's all about cost effective ways. So we do it on Zoom. We work with an editor. It works for us. Like it's easy. It's something that we can spit out really quickly because we know the content is just about telling it a way that's short, it's concise. You know, it really gets to the female founders in an easy way. Yeah, I'm like, I'm seeing the little pre-rolls. I like how you put it with the, the videos like in the background and you kind of make it so it's all nice and branded. It looks good. Good job. Listen, we got to hey. do what we can out here for female <laughs> founders. <laughs> right. Especially now. Oh, man. Well, we got some questions, advice questions here. So I'm going to tee up the first one and let's see what we can answer and solve. First one here, Dear Bamp. This is more of an internal comms question. I handle IR and internal comms for a team of about a thousand at our startup. 2020 was a rough year for many, of course, and we have many workers full-time and some contractors that are working in some of our production facilities. As I'm drafting up the year in review note, I'm leery of overhyping the massive success we've had this year as a company to our entire team. Obviously, our investors want to hear about our metrics and know that they've been outstanding. I'm thinking I have a separate but similar note for the investors versus the entire team. What are your thoughts on this? That's a really good question. And I agree, it's important not to be tone deaf, especially with these communications and the fact that, you know, everyone externally is getting inundated with tons of communications. So I would say a couple of things. So for investors, it's very important to highlight your success as you want to continue to share that your momentum hasn't slowed down despite the global pandemic we're still in. And especially when so many other firms weren't as fortunate to actually survive the pandemic. It's really, really important to share that like, hey, we're still here. We're doing what we can to push forward. For the entire team, I would focus on thanking them for their ongoing support, highlighting a few big wins for the year, but also wishing them to stay safe and and ending with a happy holidays message or whatever message that makes sense. The goal here really is like to be human together. Mm. I think everyone's doubled down on that recently. And I don't think you take that out of the investor stuff either. There's no reason to not acknowledge the environment we're all in, acknowledge the time of the year and be honest, be open. I'm sure there's some things that did not go great. So put those all in. I think now is the time on transparency and getting that voice to be honest and real. Absolutely. But just be sure that you do share like momentum a little bit more for investors because they want to know where their money is going. (laughs) Yes, yes, exactly. And a lot of times with investor notes, sometimes those are deemed confidential or whatever it may be. So like all those big planning things that haven't been yet told to the team, that's why investors in the sense of knowing like what is confidential information. So it's, it's not often that, at least I haven't seen in like news cycles where it's like, oh, this confidential investor notes leak to employee A and oh, that, it, like that doesn't seem to often, too often happen. No, I agree. I agree. All right. Next one here. Dear Banff, I'm starting in house at a startup in early 2021 and I'm the very first hire in the realm of marketing. We've all been there. I have a lot of fintech experience and I am used to having global teams of nearly a hundred people working under my department. So my concern is what surprises has anyone had going in-house to a small under 50 person startup from large corporations? 
Do not get me wrong. I'm so excited about this role and I feel I can make a tremendous impact, which is why I love starting at Square Zero with this startup. So I was going to say, first of all, that's a really good question and fantastic. Congratulations to whoever's moving in that direction. I love working in white space, so I know it will be enjoyable. I would say the biggest surprise that anyone has moving from corporate to startup land is the amount of work that needs to be done with a very lean team and maybe just you as the first member of marketing to really kick off the ground running. Like it can be really overwhelming at times, but it's just making sure that you can level set as much as you can because you will be the one responsible. So for those administrative tasks that are tedious to creating a strategy and executing on the strategy, really look to see if you can't hire you know, another team member to support you right then and there. Look to utilize freelance agencies or freelancers in general. There are a lot of freelancers that have kind of hit the scene recently because, as we know, layoffs were really big this year. So there's a lot of great people out there just looking to consult, pick up one-off projects that can be really, really useful for you now and in the future, too, as well at a, you know, a much more cost-efficient way. So look at doing that as, as kind of your first step within 30 to 60 days. And I would also say pace yourself. <laughs> yeah. Pace yeah. yourself when you go into a startup. There's so many things that you want to get done and get streamlined. You need to focus on those priorities that actually have to be done and that helps drive business to your firm. Bottom line, you need to make sure you're consistently staying, you know, close to the founders slash the CEO on a regular basis and they're aware of like what you're working on. Because when it's that small, trust me when I say everyone wants to make sure that you're kind of going down the same type of path and navigating the same way that's most beneficial in a cost-effective way for the company. I think the the biggest thing, I completely agree with all this, but in startups, especially at this size, everyone can see everyone's or. In other words, are you paddling as hard as I am? Because I can freaking see you. (laughs) Yes. And I don't mean visually right now, like physically, I can see you across the way, but you can see what's going on with everybody because it's too small to hide. I always tell people like grads, college people, don't go to a startup if you, if you want to like slip away and be under five levels. No, and no not way. at all. You're you will in die. front. You will die. Correct. And don't go to a startup <laughs> thinking that you're going to have a team around you. That's you should have thing. it in your head <laughs> that you might be the only one for 30 to 90 days or even maybe the year oh, until a, year, two. a yeah. year or two years until you actually have the budget to get other people on your team. So you have to work smarter, not harder. And remember, budget, the budgeting is the key and working with founder, CEO very closely is also another key. Mm-hmm. I have to say, I completely align with that. One person told me similar to this, similar to this, that, you know, you had this massive team, it was global, you know, all these people reporting. And a lot of your time at that level is meetings and who's doing what over there? What's Brazil doing? And are they talking to France? And are they, you know, all, you're, you're consumed by meetings. Like this is going to be the 180 of like, you no, know, you don't have any means because it's just with yourself. So you are going to be executing. And to your point, Elise, you're not going to have these hundred people again, full time in your internal army, let's say. Instead, figure out your freelance army that can attach on. And great point. So much talent is out there right now. A lot of people, and, and you can work with anybody anywhere. That's the other aspect. People are everywhere. No one has to be confined to a location. So you could easily, although it will take time, assemble that, that army, that built on army that will not be full time in house with you. No but will likely, assuming you get that budget conversation done, be able to help you and you'll get the one person who could do the video. You get the one person who could do the production. You get the one person, your content person. You got one person. So you can assemble that group. Again, assuming you can get the budget, but hopefully you brought on with the anticipation that you're going to do and get some resources. Absolutely. And then the last thing too, I would say on that point is... Also find an army of peers. That's right. So similar to the amazing Slack channel that Beck here set up, BC and comms, 
Like you have to find your army you can lean on, speak to, because you will need support during this because you will be honestly on an island by yourself trying to work out all the deliverables that need to be, you know, done within the strategy. So find others that you can speak to that might have advice on how to, you know, move the needle forward. I think that's so important and so beneficial. Yes. And if you can find that group, then you can save yourself quite a bit of heartache of trying to find, trying to find, you know, asking everybody, you just can go to that group. Hey, who has a production assistant person who does this? Who has a graphic designer that does infographics for fintech companies? They're usually a good community will have that resource and go, Oh, I know I have somebody, you know. And so we actually, in our little group, we have a spreadsheet. So now we kind of have it organized. I got to add some people to that, by the way. But yes, yeah, so then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So in other words, your army can be accelerated if you're, if you get into a good community that could help. Absolutely. And let me just say the spreadsheets of just the freelancers that are available oh my God, is right. amazing. It is a lifesaver. <laughs> just to know you is can that just go to that spreadsheet. <laughs> yes. That's not on our original spreadsheet. It was that no. other person. Who, who yeah. was it that scared it? God, let's give her a shout out. We got to find it. That was amazing. It was I amazing. It. I agree. You I have to find, find it. it. And then also we have one in-house that my other colleague put together, which is phenomenal as well. Ah, oh, see, people have done what you've done, person who wrote us. Like, there's already people who have assembled that army, so don't you recreate it. You can easily find it. Last one we have here, Elise. Dear Banff, I have a challenging client that is in the finance and personal data realm. As usual, the founder wants to see top-tier press. I'm wondering if there is a protocol or system I can give this founder so she clearly understands what it takes to accomplish top-tier press. Another struggle with this client is that we get dooming, vague language pretty consistently, such as, if I don't have any traction with this press release, it will be very disappointing. Please help. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, that's, I think that's something that everyone in marketing and comms has experienced over and over again. So I understand it's a constant struggle. I mean, everyone wants top tier press, bottom line. Is everyone to get top tier press all the time? No. So I would try your best to first level set with the client in the beginning before taking on the account. If you can, if you already have the account, I would just level set again and explain that you would try your best to get top tier press and take them along the journey of highlighting targets, expectations, et cetera. I think you have to make sure that, you know, you consistently keep a level of transparency. So then no one, no client, not even you, you're shocked at the end. Yo, yeah. And then I would also say it's helpful to share examples of companies that have received certain profiles or accomplished the top tier press and why, because maybe you're not getting something you need from the client, no matter how much you've like kind of pressed them to provide that information. I think it's always good to provide those examples so they know where the bar is for that type of press. I would say at Anthemis, we consistently work hand in hand with our startups to ensure we understand their PR objectives, top tier targets, and ensure they're also building relationships also along the way, because sometimes it's truly about who you know. Oh, it is. It is. It is. I feel for this person. And actually, we solved for this with a very simple slide. It's a workable slide. We're implementing it across a lot of our clients. And all it is, it is nothing too magical, but it's just visual and it's clear, which is, okay, here's the fictional headline. You make it up and here's the writer. Here's the outlet that we would want it in. Okay, great. That sounds great. Then there's a box. Oh, well, who is that headline for? What is the audience we're going for? And this allows you to consistently point back to the strategy you're executing from a comms perspective. So if it's, Hey, I want a great story about how I raise horses in my apartment. It's like, is is that relevant to your investors, consumers, et cetera, et cetera? If the answer is no, do not do that story. You don't, that's just like a, a ego piece, right? There's one box where you outline, you put, oh yeah, this is audience three that we're going for. Aha, investors, let's say, fintech investors. Great. Then there's another box and it's assets needed to accomplish this story. Now, it's not 100%, of course. You can never guarantee 100%. And then what our team does is we fill it in. We go, okay, well, to have the best chance of that top tier outlet, that headline right there, these are the six things we're going to need. We're going to need data. 
We're going to need to visually display that data. So we need graphics. We're going to need two customers who could speak to the media. We're going to need an expert from the FDA who's your partner or whatever. Like the, I'm, I'm making up these fictional things, but it's a list. And of course, it doesn't mean you get six out of six. It's 100%. But it does mean that if you do secure those, let's say, six out of six on the list of what you need, you're much more likely to have success with a story for a reporter. Because the most annoying thing for a reporter, well, they have a lot of annoying things with PR people. But one of the most is you're just trying to push, don't you want to feature my CEO? Don't you want to you know, get an article on my CEO or something like that? It's like, that's not a story. That's just, I like to call it plating a story. There's nothing on the plate. There's no other expert. There's no other trend. There's no other relevance. There's no other customers. There's no other. So played up the story and we've found so far, um, this is still experimental, but so far that's been super helpful. That sounds amazing. Would love if you can share that template. Maybe I'll put that in the Slack. I made a little Loom video on it too, so people can get it. I love that. I mean, that would be such a good way to visualize Beck. It's I visual agree. and it's one page. And it's one slide. So sometimes all you need is that one page. So they know if they don't have that information that they most likely won't be getting a top tier target. And, mm -hmm. you know, that specific client is who's the blame and not you. You've only tried to help them as much as you can. You can only do as much as you actually possibly can to get the job done. I also like, and I mean, I test tools on myself because I'm like, oh, I am that founder. It allows for you to visually look and go, oh, okay, so great. I have three out of the six. Cool. Let me work on number four and five. Oh, I have two out of the six. It, it just visually shows and is clear. Instead of like, well, we talked about it. Remember last week we talked about it and we only have the one thing. It just like gives a nice visual. You could check the list off. A lot of founders are list checkers. We find it to be helpful so far. That That's what consensus says so far. I hope this is helpful for this person. Now, the second part, at least. The second part is the ominous doomsday stuff. If I don't get any traction, what would you say to that part? Those doom and gloom things that you'll hear from people. That's always super frustrating, especially when you're trying your hardest to get it done. I would say just consistently be authentic and honest and make sure they know you are doing what you need to do to get it done. And that's why I think it's so important to take people along the journey with you and set expectations early on and make sure your contract and also things are in writing. So then if anything does transpire at the end, you have all that information up front. So there's no disagreement of what actually took place of why you couldn't execute on something that the client wanted to happen. This is also one of those annoying <laughs> things of we need to translate feelings into actual repercussions metrics. Correct. I will feel very disappointed. Well, is that because you're going to lose a hundred clients? Is that because we're going to lose, we're going to lose our SEO value? Like what is the translation of disappointment besides you being in a sad spot? I don't like to hear any feeling stuff. I want to know why does it matter? It needs to be action oriented. And that's why it's so important to put, put these types of communications in writing. You have to, because I know that especially now that we're in the more of the Zoom world, like you still need to use writing to follow up to, you know, have those conversations, especially something on something as important as this is. It's essential. I'd also say it's just one last thing for that. And this is kind of like the next level powerful part of it is, okay, yeah, you write something in the email. Oh, hey, we talked about this and we're going to need X, Y, and Z. Instead of just ending it there, like, oh, well, I documented it stronger is, hey, client, yeah, in order to do X, Y, and Z, we're going to need this. I'm going to need your approval by then. Is this approved? Ask the question so that then in writing, there is a, yes, this is approved. Yes, I will get this to you by this time. Yes, I something that's affirmative so that again, you could point back and go, okay, you already said, you already pointed back. We are, you know, it's clear that there was the acknowledgement, but also then the promise to do and fulfill something because you sending a documented email, eh, do they get it or not? I mean, there's no like to do item there. There's no action item, but instead, if you get a nice, like, Hey, do you agree to, or do you understand that X, Y, and Z? And then they note that then you've got your, I hate to say like evidence, but you, you've got it fully documented. Yep. Oh, at least I know. The problems for this the is day. a struggle. <laughs> this is a struggle. This is the role. This is the realm. That's why we have this podcast. 
Thank you, Elise, for being on. So fun. I'm going to do that little uh, loom for you. Send it on the channel. Okay, that sounds perfect. <gasps> Story architecture is what I call it. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Awesome. Have a good one, Elise. Thanks again. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening to Dear Banff, the advice podcast for PR and marketing pros like you. Our show was created by BAM, a PR and marketing agency headquartered in San Diego and New York City. The music you're enjoying today was composed by Tiffany Dizon, produced by Daniel Kessner, and played by San Diego Symphony's Art of Milan. If you have a tough PR and marketing question you'd like us to answer, write to us at bamtheagency.com forward slash Dear BAM. Don't forget the F. If you'd like to get notified of our latest episodes, subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts and review us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts.